My name is Chris Song, National Sales Manager for Green River Spirits. Um, everything that Allison talked about and, and what Monique uh, will talk about just makes you want to go, ah! Um, Green River, and, and I'm going to dive a little bit into Green River, what we do, uh, how we do it, uh, how our business has been significantly affected through supply chain, not just through shipping, but like Allison had mentioned before, uh, all of the other things that are typical uh, headaches that we have to deal with on a regular basis are compounded by the fact of all the delays in freight, delays in labor, being able to unload containers. Uh, it's just caused absolute disruption through the entire supply chain. Uh, my history for the last two and a half years, I've been with Green River Spirits. We are predominantly a B2B contract manufacturer company. We have three main business pillars, and I'll dive into those uh, here shortly. Contract manufacturer when it comes to production of whiskey, vodka, a number of different spirits categories for our brand partners. We also sell bulk spirits in uh, new fill barrels, aged barrels, also in tankers internationally and domestic uh, all across the globe. And then we also sell direct to retail. So we have a supply, uh, supplier permit that uh, allows us to work through a distributor network and sell to the Total Wines and the BevMo's and the ABC's of the world. We just added on a fourth business pillar called uh, our branded uh, business pillar. And we're actually reviving the Green River Whiskey brand from 1885, thanks to our purchase of the distillery on the historic land where DSP KY10 previously existed. And I'll, I'll dive into that. Um, our business is a little unique because we're not like a Diageo of the world or a Sazerac of the world or a, a Beam Suntory of the world. Our business primarily is producing brands for other people, which is even more crucial for us to manage that business and our production uh, side for our brand partners. Because in essence, what we've done is we've added a fourth layer to the three tier system. And so part of that delay in the supply chain, like Allison was mentioning every day, I get a call from a customer says, what do you mean? You told me it was gonna be two weeks and now we're six weeks later and I still don't have any boxes for my goods. Or what do you mean there's no bottles that are available? Or you know, I, it, what, what's the solution? So I'll, I'll dive a little more uh, into that here shortly. So like I mentioned, uh, Green River Spirits Company, we actually have two facilities, one based in North Charleston, South Carolina, the other based in uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. We're the westernmost point on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Green River Spirits Company actually, uh, Green River Distillery is actually on the same site that the original Green River Distillery was back in 1885. Uh, the family who actually owned the distillery was smart enough to renew that DSP license every five years. And so we're fortunate enough to have DSP KY number 10. So we're actually producing whiskey uh, where the original Green River whiskey brand was produced back in 1885. Now, at, at the time, and I'm told up until Prohibition, uh, when there was a fire at the distillery, is the most advertised brand on the planet. And so uh, I'll, I'll put this out there. The market, marketing director would appreciate any and all Green River memorabilia you may have found on the Internet or, or uh, have available through your grandma or grandpa's attic. Uh, a, little, a little information about the distillery. So like I mentioned, it's the most advertised distillery back in 1885. They're producing a number of different whiskeys there. We'll actually be relaunching the Green River bourbon brand here, um, potentially Q4. It was supposed to happen in June, but of course supply chain issues when it comes to glass, be uh, corrugate, um, certainly not the whiskey, but uh, all of the timelines have been pushed back imperative and if there's one word that i can use with the disruption in the supply chain uh, it, it's absolutely imperative to be flexible not only to be flexible but always have a plan b and in these times especially in 2021 have a plan b c d and e uh, in order to to really get uh, the sales go listen the, the pandemic uh, i don't foresee it's going to end anytime soon with new variants popping up um, but certainly we have to move business forward uh, and and the business certainly isn't going to slow down at all so um like I mentioned, two facilities, one in Charleston, South Carolina, where we do predominantly flavored whiskeys, vodkas, rums, gins, tequilas, and then DSP KY number 10, Green River Distilling Company, uh, where we'll be reviving Green River bourbon brand, but we also produce a number of brands for our brand partners, i.e. Uh, Bradshaw Bourbons of the World, uh, Howlerhead Banana Bourbon for uh, the Wooler Brands team, uh, and a number of other brands uh, from there. So our capabilities and capacities, we supply liquid, we supply barrels, we contract manufacture, we can bottle, we can handle the design, we can handle the marketing. Uh, one thing we're not in is the actual distribution standpoint. So we're really just a contract manufacturer for our partners. You know, 50 to 60% of the brands that you walk into uh, in a store are produced by somebody else. Uh, certainly with the DBA at their particular DSP, 
But what that does is it gives us a, a unique advantage because our business model, 90, 95% of what we do is producing brands for other people. Not only that, it's not a one-stop shop. So you don't just come to us, have us produce a brand and walk away. We're there with Spirits Industries. Our, my marketing director actually launched a Truly brand with Boston Beer Company. I've been with a number of different suppliers um, with Jim Beam uh, and Russian Standard and, and through the uh, distribution network with Premier Beverage before they became Breakproof. So we have experts in each part of the industry that can walk our brand owners through uh, what it takes in order to get a brand from grain to glass or from concept to shelf. The third and fourth one there, I'll, I'll talk about in a little more detail, production and logistics, um, and then quality control that comes with it. So you guys are the first public people to see the new Green River bottle. Um, so this is, this is our fourth pillar here on the right side. But like I mentioned before, bulk spirits, predominantly barrel sales and tankers, private brands is what we call our contract manufacturer and B2B, uh, absolutely maintaining and managing each point of the supply chain and the production side for our brand partners so that they can then act as supplier into the distributors of the world. And then retailer brands, which is a direct sales to the Total Wines ABC of the world. And then our fourth pillar there, the Green River Bourbon brand. Uh, our intent is still not to become a branded business. The Green River Bourbon brand is really going to be the anchor for our private brand uh, customers and our pillars, the other three pillars in order to have that anchor that, look, this is a brand that comes from the 10th oldest distillery in Kentucky. This is a place that you can build your brand at and the home of uh, whatever brand it is that you want us to produce for you. So let's talk a little bit about contract manufacturing and, and how we've been affected through the supply chain. Number one, the timeliness of materials. Uh, each brand partner comes to us with a business proposal and certainly have commitments, uh, guarantees, and contracts when it comes to distributors or they're talking to a number of retailers. Uh, we no longer in the business of uh, taking orders and brands for guys who've been producing whiskey in their closet or in their backyard and want 150 to 200 cases. Our business really is producing for uh, the Palm Bay's Internationals of the Worlds, which uh, I'm talking uh, with Dave uh, here about a couple of projects, but also for the major suppliers of the world. That being said, of course, they have commitments and timelines and financial obligations to their board members or to their shareholders that have to be met within, say, a 12 month or, or calendar year. Time on the water is making a significant increase in uh, delays, uh, clearing customs, inland transport and freight. Uh, we've had a number of issues and in and, and any other environment, it wouldn't be any issue uh, with significant delay, i.e. we've got, there's been a lot of consolidation within the bottle production industry. So large uh, bottle producers, uh, Owens, Illinois, are buying these smaller guys and they're not keeping those facilities open. So what they're doing is they're actually uh, um, incorporating the old business into theirs. Compound that on the fact of moving production from the U.S. into India, you're talking about uh, delays in setting up bottling lines that come to it. And so in essence, what we've done is we've added from a two month lead time for getting a bottle that's an off the shelf bottle that there's a, an, an available supply of 200, 300,000 units. We've effectively added another three to four to five months on top of that because of the freight logistics supply chain issues. The containers get to the US, they sit in the port for an extra month. They've made commitments in order to get the brands launched. They've got funding that's coming in. Uh, this is all issues that we've had to deal with uh, across the board. Same with same goes with uh, materials as well. Corrugate's been a huge issue for us. I was just in Kentucky yesterday. Lead times that have previously have taken us two weeks are now being pushed out to eight weeks. And that is not the most uh, easy conversation to have with customers, certainly when they're trying to drive a number and put money into their pocket and they've invested half a million, uh, $750,000 and their life savings into a brand and then to tell them, well, you're gonna be delayed for another six months in order to get something to the shelf. So we're trying to manage all that and mitigate any of the delays that are expected. Um, imperative for us, understanding uh, customer projections, understanding who they're selling to, when they're selling to them, what we can do from our side. We really have no line of sight as a contract manufacturer into distribution and launch into some of these states through commitments that they have. Um, we have to understand certainly what it takes for us to produce and the timeline that needs to be produced in order to meet their timelines and expectations. Four or five million dollars in a marketing campaign that launches in May and then there's no brand onto the shelf until September, October is a huge issue. So what we've had to do is be flexible and come up with alternative options for uh, brand development. Uh, we've got a bottle that uh, is an off the shelf bottle. We've got three or 400,000 units that are available with it. 
all of a sudden supply chain out of China has been um, terminated or, or the lead times are six months out. What we're doing today uh, was unheard of as recently as two or three years ago. And the reason we were buying a, a, quite a few um, glass, out of, uh, glass bottles out of China, it was just cheaper. And the shipping rates were, you know, we could get a container for $3,800, $4,000 out of China. I got a quote the other day for one of my customers for $17,000. It sat on the wa uh, came on the water, and six weeks later, he got an invoice for twenty thousand dollars. So they have essentially increased it by three thousand dollars as soon as it showed up to port. What what that's done for us as a contract manufacturer is we don't account for the twenty thousand dollars. We've been accounting for the four thousand, and so now what we're doing is having those difficult conversations with our customers because ultimately everything is going to be passed on to the consumer. Is that we're going to have to raise your price? There's just uh, no doubt about it. And I had a, a conversation with my procurement and my finance director yesterday. I said, look, the airlines raised the baggage. Uh, they started charging baggage fee when the bottom fell out of the economy. The baggage fees have not gone away. So I don't suspect that these charges and these, these, these um, five, six digit freight charges are gonna go away anytime soon. So it all has to be accounted for. And ultimately it all leads back into a, a, a shelf retail price they've got to account for. And certainly what we try and do from our side is to be flexible. and. Uh, they have a brand idea that may go at a $29.99. Well, with the significant increases that come to it, you're talking about threefold or, or cutting it by three, what the cost is going to be to them from us. And so they're going to have to readjust where their thinking is on the shelf. Good thing is that a lot of the premium spirits today are really in high growth categories. You've got a couple du double digit growth in, in a few of the categories. Ultimately, it's the liquid that's going to be in the bottle that are going to be people bringing back to it and the silent salesmen from what they're selling on the shelf for people to grab off the shelf. So we've been able to pivot um, quickly to do that. What to expect for the foreseeable future? I don't foresee this changing and, and it's good to know that potentially there'll be some relief in Q2, Q3 of 2022. But until that point happens, we have to operate today just like there'll be interruptions from a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we've done everything we can. I have a couple of customers who, um, a, a couple of our customers who are re relatively brand new, launching brands in 2019, brand plans to do 15, 20,000 cases within a 12 month period. Pandemic hits in March of 2020, and essentially we're sitting on five, six, seven, eight thousand cases in our warehouse because all markets have shut down, all on premises shut down, nobody's going out. Then direct to consumer sales start to open up between a number of the states and liquor boards. Well, they're not buying the brand that just launched three or four months ago. They're buying the Jack Daniels of the world. They're buying the Jim Beams of the world. And so uh, as markets started to open back up, we were fortunate enough that they had distributor commitments and contracts together where the business started to uptick. Now what we've run into is that with the world being open for the first half of the year this year versus last year, I've got three customers that have uh, quadrupled their volume just in the first quarter, first two quarters of this year. That adds to complexities with supply chain as well. An off the shelf bottle that we've had for a customer, uh, let's call it a standard whiskey bottle. We call it a Tennessee bottle. Uh, you know, the, the uh, supplier can supply that relatively easily, but up to 100,000 units. Well, now my customers are going to 200, 250,000 units on an annual basis, and we've got to try and manage uh, the purchasing and supply chain there. We've had to pivot to another bottle. There's an alternative bottle that has to be done, or like I mentioned before, where they're moving production facilities. Unheard of for us to buy U.S. glass, but that's what we've moved to because the shipping rates are so expensive and so astronomical. It's cheaper for us to buy something that was based here in the U.S. as opposed to uh, internationally, just for overall cost sakes. So we've been able to pivot on that side. Um, assume that direct-to-consumer will continue to grow. I don't see uh, for the foreseeable future the three-tier distribution system, I, I, I don't see it ever going away, in all honesty. I think uh, the, the middle tier with the distribution side takes all of the risk when it comes to uh, distribution in the spirits industry for us anyways. They're the ones that are the feet on the street. They're the ones that are doing the warehousing. They're the ones that keep the cases out of our facilities so they can hold the inventory and move it along. But I do see that there'll be a pivot towards direct to consumer with uh, my kids doing uh, school online for nine months out of the year, eight months out of the year, uh, it, all it's done is it's sped up the process of us being able to sell direct to consumer with a pass through, certainly um, with the distributor or someone else on the other side. And then spirits categories, the value brands are always going to sell at the bottom, um, not really um, instrumental when it comes to a, a full brand direction. Obviously, uh, they're the purchasing the, the value brands for a price point. 
But uh, you are going to see more segmentation and more premiumization, I believe, across all categories, um, even the ones that are uh, in decline today. Uh, I think rum is probably the one that's most in decline. But the high-end rums, the aged rums, uh, old age brands and products, I think will continue to grow and continue to rise. More importantly, if you have a friend or you have someone in the entertainment business, the celebrity has changed the entire spirits industry when it comes. Terramana tequila is going to do 300,000 cases this year or more uh, in, in two, two and a half years. Kylie Jenner's brand is going to sell 100,000 cases in the first year that it's been released. That, that's absolutely insane. And that just hasn't happened in, in the 20 years that I've been in the spirits industry. But that celebrity, uh, the, on, the online focus of a lot of the um, young drinkers that are coming of age now to be 21, they're all, in, uh, they've been invested. They've grown up with the internet. They've grown up with celebrity. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Um, so I think it's imperative that uh, we keep, a track, keep track on the premium price points that are moving along. That's really it for me. Um, it's a lot of information to, to understand. You can go to our websites, greenriverdistilling.com, greenriverspiritscompany.com. It'll dive a little bit more into uh, our supply chain, what we do. Uh, it'll also uh, walk you through some of the costs that we have associated with uh, production from our side. But it's really imperative if you're a brand owner, you're planning to launch your own brand, you're planning to uh, distribute. Uh, these two ladies have um, some of the best knowledge that I, I, I've ever I've been introduced to anyone in the industry. But it's imperative that you be flexible. Um, if you have a set amount of dollars in order to launch a brand, you have a set amount of dollars and you have commitments to shareholders in order to uh, deliver something for the shelf, multiply it times three. The timelines that are associated with it, multiply that times three. And then work off of the one third that you actually have because in essence, anything can get accomplished. Um, we've actually started, I've got a, a, another brand partner who's scaling to 120,000 cases this year. And in essence, uh, we've started to incentivize our bottling team to work later 12, 14 hour shifts. We've also incentivized our bottle producers to pivot and produce our bottle in place of another bottle because everybody and their mother is having the same issues that we are. And so the costs start to accumulate and we started to split that with some of our partners, but he's having to account for that now. So some of his marketing spend has been pulled back in order to account for a supply chain issue. So be flexible, uh, make sure you have extra in the kitty for whatever you need to do. Um, I'll leave it at that and, and let Monique dive into uh, wine and the distribution side.